Hey, Elena. Hi, Luke. How's it going? It's going great because I got a postcard from you. You this did? Week. <laughs> Thank you. That was so nice. A couple of weeks ago on the show, you said that you were going to send me a postcard. And I thought it was just one of those Hollywood things where, like, you said it, but then you weren't going to follow up. And you did. And it really made my week. But it didn't have a dinosaur on it like I wanted. I thought I had a dinosaur one to send you because that's what you wanted. I, this was perfect, Elena, and I really appreciate it. We talk every week on the show, but it was nice to get a piece of mail from you. I will send you a postcard as a thank you. Are, are you saying that, or are you actually going to No, do I it? mean it in the kind of Hollywood way that Great. I'm probably not going to really do it. Are you ready to do the radio show? Let's do it. Molly, are we recording? We are recording. All right, take it away. <laughs> From PRX, it's Livewire. Recorded from our actual houses, welcome to the Livewire house party. This week, poet Ross Gay and comedian Cameron Esposito with music from The Lone Bellow. I'm your announcer, Elena Passarello, and now from a small room just off his kitchen, the host of Livewire, Lou. Oh, thank you so much, Elena Passarello. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We have a delightful show in store for you this week. I mean, maybe the most delightful show we've done in a long time because we're going to talk to Ross Gay about his book called The Book of Delights. We also asked the Livewire listeners a question, as we always do. We asked folks to tell us about something that delights you, and we're going to read those responses coming up in just a few minutes. First, though, we have to start the show, as we always do, with the best news we heard all week. This is our little reminder right at the start of the show that uh, there are good things happening in the world, and it's uh, worth taking a moment to talk about them. Elena, what's the best news you heard all week? Okay, this is not just the best news I've heard all week. This is in terms of the category of fraternities, the best fraternity mm -hmm. news I've ever heard in my entire life. Okay. <laughs> I feel like the bar is fairly low. It's like this and then Animal House as a cinematic masterpiece <laughs> filmed in Eugene, sure. Oregon. True story. Okay, what's well, happening in the world of fraternities that was the best news you heard all week? Okay, this is down at LSU in, I believe, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, great SEC okay. school, the Phi Gamma Delta Fraternity House. They, they are known as the Fijis. Um, okay. Just did something really nice for a former employee. The woman's name is Jessie Hamilton, and okay. she was a cook at the Fiji House. She kind of cooked for all the fraternity brothers from 1982 to 1996. And the brothers for whom she cooked and that she took care of, you know, totally remembered her. She would fix a plate for them if they missed dinner, just like classic Southern Aww. love. 30 years later, they find out that um, she is having a hard time paying the bills. And these frat brothers, who are now adults, right, they paid off her mortgage. Aww. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they, they just like took up a collection and basically yeah. paid her house They're off. They're all like doctors and lawyers and rocket surgeons right. or whatever now. And they yeah. did like a huge Fiji GoFundMe and surprised her with, uh, she was a single mother of three back in the day. And they surprised her as a uh, expression of gratitude. That is only fair because yeah. they would not have gone on to be doctors and lawyers and rocket surgeons. Mm -hmm without being properly nourished That's right. during their college years, all because of this lovely person. Also, have you ever been in a fraternity house? Like, you should get your mortgage paid off just for walking in and not, like, immediately <laughs> leaving. It's so stinky. <laughs> when I was a freshman at the University of Washington, I got a couple of calls from the fraternities, you know, looking for new pledges. Mm. And I said, what's the policy on me bringing a baby? <laughs> and they said... Goodbye. It's been nice talking to you, Mr. Burbank. <laughs> Would you, are you surprised to learn that I was never recruited by any sororities throughout my time as an undergraduate? <laughs> I am not surprised to hear that. I'm not surprised that neither of us were considered. I think it was the armpit hair. I think it just sort of like ruled me out immediately. <laughs> Speaking of notable LSU grads, Elena, hmm. the best news I heard all week involved Shaquille O'Neal, a one-time LSU tiger. He was in a jewelry store in Atlanta, and this uh, this young guy was was making the final payments on his uh, an engagement ring that he had had on layaway. Remember layaway? Oh yeah, that was school clothes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. All I had like a Chicago Cubs starter jacket on layaway at the Pro Image for like six months once. <laughs> so this 
young guy is, is, is getting this uh, engagement ring, and Shaquille O'Neal just leans over, pulls out his credit card, and pays for the engagement Holy ring. Holy cannoli. That's Shaq. <laughs> I know, right? Like, apparently this is a thing Shaquille O'Neal does. Uh, he was at a furniture store recently, and there was a woman um, who was buying some furniture, and uh, her child had autism, and Shaq and his wife just paid for all of their furniture. Oh, my God. Like, he's, he's just Shaq this, a Claus. Like, <laughs> Seven foot two <laughs> agent for good out there in the world. Ugh. So that is the best news that I heard all week. Okay, let's get our first guest on over to this here house party. Ross Gay's latest collection of essays is a New York Times bestseller. And it's almost like a kind of a Buddhist practice. Um, what he decided to do was to figure out one thing that delighted him every day for one year and write about it. The book is called, you guessed it, The Book of Delights. And honestly, it's just what the doctor ordered with everything that's going on in the world. So take a listen to this. It's our chat with Ross Gay, recorded at the Alberta Rose Theater in Portland back in 2019. Hi, Ross. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. This book is, not to be redundant, but it truly is a delight. Like, it's just so joyful to read it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it should be like they should be prescribing it at the pharmacy, mm -hmm. maybe instead of various drugs that they're prescribing. <laughs> it's like a way healthier way to feel better. Yeah. Good. What, yeah. what, what were the rules of, of the creation of it? You know, I had like three rules. I, you know, I was walking, um, <laughs> I was walking to this writing residency that I had. I was in Italy, and um, it was in a it was in a castle. <laughs> so I was walking back through, you know, from some espressos to a to my room in the castle, where they were cooking for me. Oh, God! Yeah. And I was like, man, this is delightful. <laughs> yeah. I should write an essay about it, you know. And I thought, yeah, that'd be, that'd be okay. And then I thought, oh, it'd be, it'd be really interesting if I wrote an essay every single day for a year about something that delighted me. So that's kind of the kind of frame of the book. And the, the rules were that I wrote them every day, which I promptly, you know, broke that rule. Uh, <laughs> that I um, write them by hand, and then I write them sort of quickly. Okay. Yeah. You write about the delight muscle in the book. Can yeah. you explain that for folks? You know, it's just like... Yeah. I think I maybe talk about it in the introduction. I I was sort of nervous, you know. I was like, I thought this is this is going to be a challenge, you know, to notice a delightful thing in my day, every day, um, and very quick, you know. I was sort of I was sort of worried in a way, like how am I going to do that? And then within two weeks, it just given as this became my job, boom, 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 boom. I sort of realized, oh yeah, yeah. I'm sort of in the midst of a kind of delight. Often, you know. Are you saying that it like sort of opened your aperture to be more aware of it. delight? Yeah, I think that's exactly it. Yeah. Um, was it hard to find a delight on certain days? Like when you weren't in that flow state? I mean, I could be busy, you know. The days could also would also be filled with sorrow and uh, the rest. Um, but most days it was more like, oh, damn, that's, that's incredible, you know, or that's an amazing thing. And then if I, you know, didn't write an essay about it, it's because I didn't have time or I got busy doing something else. But you were like, did you have a, a, like a notes app in your phone or something? Like if you'd walk <laughs> by something and be like, oh, that's it. That's today's delight. <laughs> you don't know me good enough to know that that phone comment was like, no, I did not write it in my phone. Are you, are you very anti -phone? Well, you know, like, uh, yeah, I f hate him. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, let's talk about that. Because you, in this book, you appear to take more joy in plants and things that are growing than, like, you know, anybody who I've read in a long time. Yeah. Is that because you're not looking at your phone, you're able to, like, be more connected to the actual physical world around you? I wonder. I mean, you know, I, like anyone, am sort of addictable to those things. So I try to keep them to the extent that it's possible out of my life. But, you know, I do feel like <laughs> it's a real thing. Like when you don't have that device to like, instead of like look at the flower or smell the flower, um, you take a picture of the flower. Mm -hmm. 
you know. Right. It, it's kind of nice, like that sort of yeah. mediation between the actual thing that is delighting you and the, the thing that has to capture the fact that you've, in fact, been delighted. Mm -hmm. And it's a little box, you know. It's like when you go to the aquarium and there's one of those walls of mm -hmm. water and there's a jellyfish floating by and you can only see the jellyfish through the phones of the people that are closer <laughs> to the cage yeah, yeah, than yeah, you yeah, are. Yeah, totally. yeah. You're like, I think I'm experiencing Or basically this. at any concert now, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, it's just, it's like a sea of phones. And I am not guilty of that particular one, but I'm guilty of a lot of them. I mean, if I look through my phone, it's a series of cute things that my dog or cat have done <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. that I was obsessed with trying to get footage of. Yeah, and I talked yeah. about this on the show a few weeks ago. We had a snake loose in the house that our cat had brought in. And oh. instead of just getting the snake out of the house, I went to try to videotape it. <laughs> and then the snake got into the... HVAC of our house and is still in there. Whoa. <laughs> so that Whoa. would be a strong vote against phone yeah. obsession. Amazing. <laughs> um, this, this book reads also like a bit of a mindfulness uh, exercise. Have you been a pretty mindful person in your life? Is that a practice that you have? I definitely, yeah, have a life of going in and out of various kinds of intentional um, meditation and stuff, for sure. Yeah, and I, and I think that's exactly right. Like, you know, and, and the way I sort of originally was talking about it and thinking about it was as a discipline. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then, then I, you know, that word, I was sort of like, eh. I got more interested in the word practice, you know, that it's a practice, you know, and the, and the practice really is the practice of, you know, noticing what it is that delights you, but maybe more um, to the point noticing what it is that you love. One of the things that you write in here is your mom has not always been keen on praise, <laughs> which I thought was like a very elegant way to say maybe a little holds back a little bit. <laughs> is there a delight even in that? I mean, you're writing about it in a pretty nice way. Wait, is there a delight in my mom being withholding of praise when I was a child? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, could you get that hardcore with it? Yeah, I don't know. You know, all the, like when I, even when I say that, um, you know, she wanted me to get good grades. She was just, but even now when you said that, I was like, ah, oh, but she loved my cummerbund from a uh, ninth grade jazz band. She loved it. That's the cutest little cummerbund I ever saw in my life. She See? said, wow. <laughs> this is the magic of this book yeah. is I, I, you know, halfway through, I get it to a delight day that sometimes it would go to some places that I, I think really radiate a lot of negativity, like mm -hmm. talking about how a lot of popular culture capitalizes on African-American suffering. Mm -hmm. And then there's this twist into this place that shows that delight can have all of these different flavors mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like just reading the book, you're always hitting this like positive high five with what's wonderful, mm -hmm. but it's just, I feel, I feel like now delight has all these mm -hmm. different tones for me. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I have to say too, that I, I listened to the book and Ross reads the audio book. Having somebody write <laughs> about great delights is one thing, but yeah. have them read them to you for like a week while yeah. it's just, I'm freaking out. It's like, I'm talking to Prince or something right now. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Sorry. we've been Whoops. doing this show for 15 years and no one's ever said that to me. <laughs> I'm writing a, a counter project called The Book of Luke's Petty Sadness. <laughs> where every day I write about some BS thing that I am obsessed with that doesn't matter in the world and I'm keeping all the notes for it on my phone. <laughs> This is Livewire from PRX. I'm Luke Burbank. That's Elena Passarello right over there. We are playing a conversation for you that we had with the poet Ross Gay as part of the Portland Book Festival. We gotta take a quick break, but don't go anywhere because we will be right back.
Welcome back to the Livewire House Party from PRX. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarello. We are at our houses, but we are listening back to something recorded on stage at the Alberta Rose Theater. It was a conversation with the poet Ross Gay. We were talking about his book, The Book of Delights, in which he wrote about one thing that he found delight in every day for a year. Take a listen to this from the Portland Book Festival back in November of 2019. One of the things that you wrote about in the book that delighted me, because it just reminded me of my life, was paper routes. Uh, like, did you, were you, you like, had you a had a, uh, well, I had a paper route, but m more crucially, our mom got a paper route, <laughs> which sucked for us kids, because it meant we got a paper route. Uh, and then she decided on day one, after doing the first time, this is horrible, they told her you can't quit for a month. So she had to do it for a month, and we would help out. And actually, it was kind of a fun memory, but I also had my own paper routes, like weekly paper routes and stuff. And I feel like nobody talks about it. It's like a formative part of the childhood of, and adulthood of a lot of people. You know, I mean, it kind of sucked, and it was kind of lovely, you know? <laughs> it was like me and my brother did it together. Um, we did it from the time I was like 10 years old until the time I went to college, you know. We, we actually got scholarships, literally both of us got little scholarships from the Bucks County Courier Times to, <laughs> wow. to, to go to college. <laughs> yeah, we were, we were serious about it, yeah. And then my folks had paper routes, both of them. And then when I would come home from college, I would do my dad's paper route. I mean, it was like... That's a real act of love if you do someone in the family's route for them. <laughs> I, I don't mean that, you know, jokingly. Yeah, 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 it was serious. Another thing you write about in the book, though, which is kind of the other side of that, is this delight that you have in being able to blow something off. Mm -hmm. Because if you grow up, you know, fi financially on the margins, mm -hmm. there's this extremely pernicious rumor that people who don't have money are somehow lazy or mm -hmm. not on their grind. And mm -hmm. it's like, no, you are extremely on your grind. Yep. And like, blow, like taking a mental health day is just yeah. not an option for yeah. like many people in this country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and in the end of that essay, I sort of... I talk about probably about a year before my father had died, you know, he was not yet diagnosed and he with cancer and he um, I was I was home for some reason and hanging out and he was getting ready to, you know, go to work. And I think I literally said, man, blow it off. Let's go watch Hellboy, you know, and he was like, yeah, I wish I could. I wish I could. Um, and and that dude worked awful jobs for a long, a long ass time. And never once did I ever hear him say, this job sucks, you know? So the idea of being able to blow something off, to have the, the I guess, privilege or the, the latitude to say, I'm, I'm not gonna do the delight today. <laughs> to even have that is, is a delight as you write in the book. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a delight and a luck. And maybe it's a delight and a luck too, to be able to be like, you know, even coming back to the idea of capturing the, the thing instead of studying the thing or being with mm -hmm. the thing, you know, the, to blow off recording the flower as a, and, and to actually partake in smelling the flower. You know what I mean? Yeah. We're talking to Ross Gay here on Livewire. His new book is The Book of Delights. Has this changed, this practice that you were doing, has this actually had a, like now that the book is published and out in the world, are you finding yourself able to connect with that more easily, that idea of finding delight in things? I think I am. And I wonder, actually, now that you say it, I wonder if while I'm thinking about the book, like in the middle of thinking about the book, if I'm a little bit extra alert to it. But I don't think that's the case. I think it's that I do sort of walk around a little bit more just clear about being able to notice um, things that kind of, yeah, just kind of strike me, you know, surprise me with, with, how lovely they seem, or, you know, be, I, I'm a little bit more attuned. I think because I've been practicing and studying it, I think I'm a little bit more attuned to like, for instance, when people are very tender with each other in, in ways that just seem like holding the door. But, you know, holding the door is also like holding the door. And so, yes, yes, I can kind of go on and on about that. But. Would you recommend something, you know, um, like a project like this for people? Like, you know, to try to, maybe they're not going to do it every single day, but to just start to kind of keep track of this stuff? I mean, you know, I think it's worthwhile to like notice, articulate, study, and share what you love. I think that's reasonable. You know what I mean? Yeah.
And I know your, your book of poems before this is the catalog of unabashed gratitude. And now we have the book of delights. Do we have another emotion that's sending you to the next place? You know, in the process of writing this book of delights, it is... Um, Interesting, because, you know, as I was writing the book, I was sort of like, I realized, oh, I'm kind of theorizing delight in this book, and which is an interesting thing to do, mm -hmm. to theorize delight, and a fun thing to do. Um, but as I kept going on, I, w I realized, oh, my real curiosity is joy. Mm. And I'm, I'm interested in joy, and I don't mean joy like a kind of thing that you can buy. I really don't mean that. Mm -hmm. I mean joy like the sort of deep and abiding understanding which comes sometimes in glimmers or maybe if we're lucky it comes sometimes in like long breaths mm -hmm. that we are fundamentally connected and that kind of luminosity to me is is just so interesting profoundly interesting mm -hmm. you know and when I think about gratitude gratitude and joy seem to be pretty much the same okay. gratitude is connecting to that thing to me what I was just sort of talking about as is love mm -hmm. as is love Awesome. Well, Ross, it has been a joy talking to you. We really appreciate you coming on Livewire. Ross Gay, everyone, it is the Book of Delights. That was Ross Gay, recorded back in November of 2019. That was a show that we did in collaboration with the Portland Book Festival, an update on what Ross has been up to. His book, Be Holding a Poem, received the Penn Jean Stein Book Award, which sounds like a pretty big deal. Is that a huge deal, Elena? You're a writer. Yeah, any award with Penn attached to it uh, is a big deal. Yeah, congratulations, Ross. Ross is probably feeling very delighted about winning that <laughs> awesome award, so congratulations, Ross. Livewire is brought to you by Alaska Airlines, providing the same familiar care their guests have come to expect and inviting you to mask up and get back out there. Learn more at alaskaair.com. This is the Livewire House Party. Of course, each week we like to ask the Livewire listeners a question, and since we're talking about the lights this week, the question was, tell us something that delights you. Elena, you've been gathering up some of those responses. What are you seeing? Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm very partial to this one from Hannah. Hannah is delighted by cats in places they shouldn't be, doing things they shouldn't be doing. I don't know what it is about cats in particular, but it's my absolute favorite thing every time. <laughs> I think that's been going around the internet lately. I think there's a kind of a, a trend of like, photos of cats in places where they don't really belong. They think it's their job. Like just today I was, I have this little two and a half year old cat who still acts like a kitten. And I just opened a cupboard that I don't normally open. And she immediately was like, oh, I have to go in there. Like they're, they're, they just mm -hmm. know, they know trouble in this hilarious way. And they're so cute when they do it. And then they stick their little faces out and look at you like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My buddy Evan, he lives on a sailboat with his cat Peta. Oh, cute. And the other day, he thought PETA had escaped. He couldn't find PETA anywhere on the boat, which is like a scary yeah. thing when you're talking about a yeah. boat. And he's going all over the marina, and he's calling for the cat, and he's got people out looking, and just turns out uh, she was just in a cupboard yeah. on the boat, <laughs> sleeping under like a book of nautical maps. <laughs> What's something else that's delighting the listeners? I don't know how we can top that, but we got to try. Oh, I love this one from Tia. Tia is delighted by seeing a new leaf or flower on one of my houseplants. I get delighted that I not only didn't kill it, but it is actually <laughs> growing. <laughs> what a delight. <laughs> yeah. I have never had a houseplant ever in my life survive um, uh, under my care. Not once. Me neither. And in fact, here in Portland, uh, I think what you can do is you can actually hire a service okay. <laughs> that will come and they will bring you some plants and then they will check up on the plants. Oh, my gosh. And that is the service that I need because I uh, also have a very, whatever the opposite of a green thumb is, I've got you that. You have a black toe. <laughs> I need to see a doctor. What's something else that's delighting one of the Livewire listeners? Oh, I like this one because I had never thought of it before. Uh, it's from Josephine who loves chewing the coffee-coated ice at the bottom of a cup of iced coffee. You get to the bottom, and it's like mm -hmm. the cherry. Well, I guess it's not the cherry on top of the sundae. It's like, it's like when people put the M&M in the bottom of the ice cream cone. 
Yes. And then you get a little delightful kind of frappuccino-y ice, which makes me really mm-hmm. want to go get some coffee now. <laughs> I feel really delighted by those responses. I'm not even being, yeah. like, just doing that for the radio show, Elena. That actually pepped me up. Me too. Um, okay, we do, of course, have a question for next week's show, which we will reveal at the end of this episode. So stay tuned for that. Ooh. First, though, we've got to invite our next guest over. Elena, if I told you that I was reading a book called Save Yourself, you'd be like, okay. About time. He's really leaning into this <laughs> pandemic. He's learning how to survive whatever it is we're going through. No, it's actually a book by friend of the show, Cameron Esposito. You might know her from her TV show, Take My Wife, or her various comedy specials. Uh, she stopped by the Livewire house party back in May of last year. This was right when we were really settling into pandemic life. She talked about using Zoom to do stand-up comedy and why her Catholic upbringing prepared her uniquely for her career in stand-up. So take a listen to this. It's Cameron Esposito at the Livewire house party from back in May of 2020. Cameron Esposito, welcome to the show. You know, Luke, I I don't know if you know that this feels very full circle for me because you were just like, ah, I'm recording in my home. But like I (laughs) came and did TBTL at your home. Right. Like one of the nine podcasts that I do. Like that's how we first met, you know, for for me and you, like our roots, like this is normal. (laughs) This feels right. Uh, Even though the times are very weird for us, uh, and that's, you know, part of why we're doing it this way. It's really nice to see you and talk to you. Uh, Speaking of the weird times that we're in right now, Cameron, I saw a clip of you on TikTok where you're in your yard talking about how your neighbors had been partying. Was that from a while ago or was that a recent thing that happened? Because I felt immediately scared for you. (laughs) It's like from two days ago. I mean, I have to say uh, congratulations to me because I have begun the initial stages of figuring out TikTok. And that (laughs) video has done well on that platform. My neighbors had a very loud party with disco lights. And I am not sure that additional people were there. Like, I don't think they (laughs) broke quarantine. Like, it it was 4 o'clock in the morning when I went out and, like, opened the window. Much like uh, Scrooge, Ebenezer Scrooge, Uh It's sure. it throws up in the sash. You there, boy? What day is yeah. it? Go get the largest turkey. I like, like, open my window and said, "Like, pardon me. I don't know if you know what time it is, or that the sound echoes." And they just turned around and walked inside, but turned down the music. And um, my girlfriend pointed out to me that they probably did know what time it was and how loud the music was, and that's why they dismissed me and walked away. <laughs> I'm very relieved to hear, though, that it was probably just your neighbors wilding out. Because when I heard you talking about a party, I started to think of vectors and bubbles being expanded and all kinds of danger. My take on this pandemic was immediate overreaction and preparation. Like, bought panic bought a bidet day one. (laughs) Didn't even install it. Mailed it back. But just to know that I had it, you know? Yeah. I've been sleeping with a hatchet. (laughs) Uh, we're talking to Cameron Esposito here on the Livewire House Party. She has a new book out called Save Yourself, which is good, mm-hmm. by the way. Uh, I oh, feel like I've you. known you, you know, for a long time, and yet there was so much stuff in here that I didn't know about your life and growing up. Um, you you grew up in Illinois in a place called Western Springs. What was the scene like there? Have you seen the movie Contagion? Like, <laughs> yes. Because like, that's, that's the movie everybody's watching right now. So yeah. in that movie... Um, Matt Damon has left his house because I think he's going to go get like, like rations from the national guard. Mm -hmm. He's driving down a small town, like main street and their Uh buildings are on fire on, on both sides of the street, but it's a very cute looking place. Uh, That's my actual hometown of Western Springs, (laughs) Illinois. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Wow. Also day one of pandemic. I was like, you know what we should do? Watch contagion. Just, I forgot that my actual hometown <laughs> is burning to the ground in that, in that movie. This explains sleeping with the hatchet and yelling at your neighbors. Yeah. I mean, you have really <laughs> good reason to take this seriously, considering years before the prophecy was foretold <laughs> in your own actual hometown. It's true. Also, you know, like seriousness. So I've been promoting the book, which is called Literally Save Yourself. And right. just congratulations to me on having a book called that coming out right now. Um, but also, 
my girlfriend who I live with is an immunosuppressed person who has been recovering from, she was super sick. She was sick for five weeks and we were in and out of the hospital and stuff. And we think with the virus. And so I just say all of this because, you know, it feels like the, a movie is happening that I'm participating in, but that also like I go home and watch the dailies. Like I go home and watch Mm, what I did during the day. And then I'm also like trying to manage the anxiety of like, there's a human that is not feeling well. And usually, you know, what I would do in that time is like be a caretaker and then also seek the things that give me comfort, my friends or Mm -hmm. say leaving the house, you know, or like going Mm -hmm. to a movie to blow off steam, go to the gym, run on a treadmill at 72, you know, miles an hour or whatever it is. And like, (laughs) right. Like a cheetah. (laughs) Yeah. Like none of that is available. So it's just this very strange time of being really present and also really detached watching me go like, well, that was a choice. We don't know if we can't even judge whether or not it's right or wrong. It's just what you're doing, kid. And this is your first book, yeah? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think it's my first and most ideal. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> that's got to be surreal, too. Like, if you ever imagine putting a book out, and then you finally do, and so you both have a book out, but you're in. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the I pivoted the book tour to Zoom. This is like, nobody's really using Zoom yet when this happened, because this was mm-hmm. really week one of all workplaces being closed, and... Um, I was Zoom bombed yeah. in a very significant that? way. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so I had friends and acquaintances that are incredibly, you know, literary. They're New York Times bestselling. Roxanne Gay, you know, Carmen sure. Maria Machado. And I, and I felt responsible not just to them to run a good event, but also 500 queer people who are like in a state of crisis Mm-hmm. all sitting in their homes, all of us going into quarantine already with weird haircuts, you know, <laughs> each of them <laughs> sitting in front of like whatever rainbow flag they have in their house. And then with their dogs all around them. And <laughs> like the first panel went so, so well. And I didn't know about zoom bombing. The second panel is going on. It's like this very raw, you know, people are crying and then zoom bombers came in and, and they shared their screen and the most hardcore pornography oh, no. I have ever seen oh, in my no. life was oh, no. suddenly happening on the screen. I was trying to figure out, like, what button did I push <laughs> right. hosting this, meet- this meeting that is like, well, like, don't press yeah. the space bar because that's the hardcore pornography <laughs> bar. You know, like, people told me later that I remained utterly calm. Um <laughs> But I did go ahead and close the meeting and then uh, relaunch it with some better protections. Uh, This is the Live Wire house party, everybody. (laughs) Welcome. We're talking to Cameron Esposito. Her new book is Save Yourself. One of the things that I wouldn't have really known about you until I read this book is you present as a very confident person on stage. I feel like that is something I've always admired about you. You're very calm, but you write in this book that... That's not how you are off stage a lot of the time or how you weren't you, know, you weren't necessarily that way growing up. Like did you start developing your act as a way of trying to be the person on stage that you wanted to be off stage? I think it's a we contain multitudes situation as human beings where you know when I was a kid I felt so goony because I was like gender nonconforming I wasn't 100% matching up with certainly in western springs and that beautiful burnt to the ground downtown. Um, I I was not necessarily noticing other people uh, dealing with the same stuff that I felt like I was dealing with. And I had an eye patch because I had crossed eyes. Mm. I had to wear the eye patch on the crossed eyes with glasses on top, you know? So just a classic (laughs) look. And I did. I get body shamed a bunch for being what I think other people perceived as chubby, but I think they just meant gay. Like, it just was, there was a (laughs) lot, I was getting a lot of messaging, and I felt so strange. And so I think, you know, overdeveloped this sense of humor. And when I'm on stage, like, that is really happening for me Mm -hmm. that I feel confident it's not faked but I do think that many comics I mean I don't want to like speak for everybody it's my read that this is how we all feel like even when Mm. I talk to other comics that may not know this themselves I'm like I see this in you I just think it's like a it's a duality thing 
where the mm -hmm. the confidence in speaking to large groups of people does not necessarily translate to the vulnerability interpersonally that is also a part of confidence. You know, one part of confidence is like, here are my irrefutable opinions. Mm -hmm. I am going to stand on stage and express them, and I am right. And another right. part mm -hmm. of confidence is here's the – worst thing that's ever happened to me. And I'm going to tell you, my friend, and I'm going to give you the opportunity to hold space for me. And I think comics are people who have used that first skill set and who mm -hmm, yeah. then have to develop the second, where there's a lot of other people who might have that interpersonal confidence, who those are the people who then t say to me, like, I don't know how you do stand up. And I'm like, I don't know how you have friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're talking to Cameron Esposito, uh, whose new book is Save Yourself. Uh, one of the things that you've really worked on in your career is really making space for other people, I think, particularly women, particularly queer people. Is there any way to do that in this day and age, like in this weird quarantine setting? Yeah, that's such a good question. I mean, I am hosting a bunch of events and like that yeah. will continue to today I'm doing stand up for an hour on zoom. So like, How's that? we'll see how that goes. Well, mm -hmm. I've been doing it in just chunks and sometimes to silence and sometimes to unmuted participants, which is helpful, but also like much worse because it's, <laughs> it's just like, uh, the technology isn't built for that. Yeah. It's uh, gotta throw your rhythm off. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that I did was several weeks ago, I borrowed four cameras and I shot a uh, like special in my house what? for, oh with, my for God. nobody. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so like, Wait. I'm about to watch the first cut of that right after this. I don't know if it will at all work or we don't know, you know, like it's, it, we're really, yeah. every comic is reinventing this thing. So yeah. we'll see. You had a TV show, Cameron, you know, like for all of us who've had the privilege of like doing television where there's a crew Boy, talk about an appreciation now that I'm trying to do these silly TV things I do from my house on my laptop. Yeah. It's like, I am sorry, Mike Hernandez, union <laughs> camera person, that I underestimated you. It does feel like the zenith of what we have all been called to do. And I don't even just mean in the entertainment industry. I think this is also true if you, like, work in marketing or, like, mm -hmm. are a nurse, where mm -hmm. then we're also all supposed to have an online presence that shows savvy, you know, like mm -hmm. we don't just have, right. it's not just about like uploading your resume to like LinkedIn or whatever. It's like, mm, but could it also look good? Mm -hmm. You just used a term Cameron uh, that is very loaded for me. Cause I grew up in the church. You said called to do something. Mm -hmm. oh. It's like a very, like that was something that get thrown around at <laughs> gospel outreach, Christian <laughs> fellowship. I didn't, I did not realize the extent of your Catholic upbringing until I read this book. This was serious business for you. Yeah, the extent of my Catholic upbringing, of course I say things like called to, it's in there. I do not have any connection to like practicing religion and I don't know that I ever will, but the cultural identity of Catholicism baked in, can't ever wash it out or whatever, <laughs> it's in there. Um, and then also, you know, I have like a very spiritual read on stand up that maybe some people who didn't want to be priests in their younger life don't <laughs> necessarily bring into things. Yeah. You, you In this book, you describe the connection really between the performer and the audience in a way that is, I, I thought, really profound and like a, a way I hadn't thought about it before as a person who regularly performs. Yeah, I, I'm so aware that some of this might sound very self-congratulatory. So I will just say, I think of this as a skill set, not necessarily like I'm uh, the Messiah that the title of a book, Save Yourself, might indicate you <laughs> <laughs> that I may think I am. It's more, um, you know, I think that as people, we are really scared and we want to know how to process the events around us. We want life to have meaning. We want to know why we are in pain. And... A lot of comedy, I mean, stand-up specifically, is people on stage talking about their feelings. It's just that many of us wear motorcycle jackets and have cool <laughs> haircuts, and so you can get confused. Wait, is this, are these cool people talking about something besides feelings? No, it's just, it's just emoting, you know? It's an event and how, how we feel about that event. You know, I think people show up because in some ways there's a submitting to being led by another mm. that you know, is the dynamic that causes people to show up in churches too. Mm -hmm. You know, we want, yeah. we want like a, some sort of unified theory 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Of what we're yeah. all doing here. Also, there's drinking, much like <laughs> right. in Catholic <laughs> Mass. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming by the house party, Cameron. You're the best. It was so great to see you both. And seriously, Luke, like I actually, we have known each other for a long time. It's really nice to see people I've known for a minute. Um, yeah, that stuff gets really intense these days, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm like basically about to burst into tears. Well, it's cathartic, so it's great to see yeah. you too. Be safe, yeah. okay? Yeah, you take care. Bye-bye. All right, thanks, Cameron. That was Cameron Esposito right here on the Livewire House Party. Her memoir is called Save Yourself. You can also hear Cameron on her podcast, Queerty, which is an hour-long conversation between Cameron and some of the brightest luminaries in the LGBTQ plus community. So do go check that out. Cameron is the best. Uh, we got to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere because when we come back, we are going to hear some music from the Lone Bellow. So stay with us. This is Livewire. Welcome back to the Livewire House Party. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarello. Our musical guests this week are known for their harmonies, their musicianship, and their raucous live performances, which we're hoping will be able to occur again in the not too distant future. Um, this uh, reputation has earned them quite the rabid fan base. They've appeared on Jimmy Kimmel Live, The Late Show with David Letterman, Conan O'Brien, pretty much all of the shows that are out there, they've been on them. Their latest album is Half Moon Light, and it's out right now. So take a listen to this. It's Zach, Kaneen, and Brian from the band The Lone Bellow. They joined us on the Livewire house party in May of last year. Hey, you guys. Hello. Hello. Where are you guys all at right now? Uh, we are in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, we all live about a mile away from each other. Um, have you done anything where you like drive up to each other's house or like stand in the yard and wave? <laughs> we just did that yesterday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How was it? I TP'd uh, Brian's house last <laughs> night, but I haven't talked to him. Dude, about that's yet. the new that's the new like making it rain when you TP somebody's yeah, house. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. I get all my TP from North Alabama. They got so much right now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so you guys are all in, in Nashville now, but I know that you had started playing together, uh, in New York really as a kind of formal band. Uh, what's the difference energetically, uh, for you guys between writing and living in a place like New York city and writing and living in a place like Nashville? I think live in New York, you kind of, you kind of like earn your stripes. So whenever we're working with people that aren't from New York, we're like, let's get started at nine. How long do you want to work? Because we could go all day. It's kind of like, it's kind of in the blood. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, and I and I hold that really dear to my heart because I really enjoyed living in New York. And that was a season. I'm surprised to hear. I always assumed that Nashville was where the real workhorse, like, pow, like the real professionals. Oh, man. They start at like noon and go home at like five. Really? <laughs> no. <laughs> it depends on if you're focusing on quality or quantity. Because quantity, mm -hmm. we'll get there early in the morning. We'll stay all day. But yeah, I, we can't make any promises about quality when it comes to <laughs> making music. Whereas the Nashville players, they'll show up at 11. They'll play for like 30 minutes. And you'll be like, oh, yeah. Okay. No one can beat that. <laughs> uh, this is the Live Wire House Party. I'm Luke Burbank with Elena Passarella. We're talking to the folks from The Lone Bello, their new album is Half Moon Light. Uh, we're going to hear a song that you guys put together 
uh, I, if I understand right, basically during quarantine, um, it's called Count on Me. What was the process like for, for creating this thing we're about to hear? Well, um, this song started at my house. So, and this, this, you're hearing Zach, by the way. Everybody yeah, this in radio is Zach. Uh, so, yeah, I recorded the guitar and the vocal and then passed it to one of our wonderful managers, Megan. And then um, she passed it on to Brian, and Brian laid down his guitar and vocal, and then passed it on to Kaneen, and she laid down her instrument and vocal. And then Megan magically put it all together somehow. Nobody knows how that happened huh. obviously <laughs> how do people how does people mix music <laughs> right i mean cuz you guys are one of the things people love about your band are the harmonies are so beautiful and i assume under normal circumstances you're harmonizing in the same room yeah. when you're recording an album i mean this is a totally different thing right was it weird Mm -hmm. yeah. Super weird, especially with all the reverb on everyone's voices. Yeah. We're at the point where we can, like, hear each other. I can, like, hear the way someone's breathing and know what they're going to do. Oh, so, my God. Yeah. Wow. wow. It's a little hard <laughs> trying to do that over Zoom, but I think we figured it out. I don't know. Well, let's take a listen to this song from The Lone Bellow. Uh, this is Count On Me. All right. <laughs> This world can take you Need an arm round your neck Somebody you can talk to When it shakes you But no one else will say it Then you need to hear the truth Let it break you let it help you lay down what you held on to. Let it break you. Let it help you lay down what you held on to. Scared to fail you. The clock's counting down. I think I got everything to prove. Been a friend of trouble. After losing it all, I got nothing else to lose. Let it break you. Let it help you lay down what you held on to. Let it break you. You can count on me if I can count on you. Help you lay down what you held on to. Help you lay down what you held on to. Here on the live wire house hey. party, that was a total first for us. Okay, we've 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 never actually like played a band's <laughs> music that's been recorded while the band was 
on the call with us, and it was clearly deeply embarrassing for you, Zach, because <laughs> you left the video. There was burned Triscuit nachos. Someone threw a stuffed horse across the camera field of vision at one point. You guys sounded great, oh though. Oh, my God. I Thank mean, you. Thank uh, you. In a million years, I would have never known that that, that was uh, something that was kind of pieced together in an unconventional no manner way. for you. So. Uh, huge credit to you guys and uh, Megan, your producer, for making that all work. That was just beautiful. Now we, like, never have to see each other. It's going to be perfect. <laughs> right. <laughs> that was the Lone Bellow on the Live Wire House Party from May of last year. They just released the deluxe version of their album, Half Moonlight, so make sure to go and check that out. All right, before we get out of here this week, a little preview of next week's show. We are going to be talking to Lacey Mosley from the show A Black Lady Sketch Show and also this podcast that I have been really getting into called Scam Goddess. We're also going to be talking to Michelle Zahner, who you may know as the musical performer Japanese Breakfast, about her incredible new memoir, Crying in H Mart. And, of course, we want to hear from you, the Live Wire listeners. We'd like to get your answer to our listener question. Elena, what is the question that we are asking the listeners for the coming week's show? It's a good one this week. What food reminds you of your childhood? Oh, yeah, that's a perfect question, considering we're going to be talking to Michelle Zahner mm -hmm. about food and her relationship with her mom. Uh, so that's the question. If you can send those answers in via social media, we would really appreciate it. We are about everywhere where social media happens. The handle is Livewire Radio, now including TikTok. What? We have a Livewire TikTok. What? Gosh, we're so hip. Is it just and you youthful. dancing? <laughs> it can be. <laughs> All right, so please go check us out on social media and send in your response to the listener question What food most reminds you of your childhood? All right, that is going to do it for our show this week. A huge thanks to our guests, Cameron Esposito, Ross Gay, and The Lone Bellow. Livewire is brought to you in part by Alaska Airlines. Special thanks this episode to Amanda Bullock, the Portland Book Festival, and Megan Letts. Laura Haddon is our executive producer. Heather D. Vichelle is our executive director. Tim Harkins is our production director. Our producer and editor is Melanie Sevchenko. Our assistant editor is Trey Hester. And our marketing associate is Jennifer Vo. Music composition by A. Walker Spring and technical direction and audio mix by Molly Pettit. Additional funding provided by the Oregon Cultural Trust and the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation. Livewire was created by Robin Tenenbaum and Kate Sokoloff. Our show is made possible by the generous support of our members. This week, we'd like to thank members Hannah Davidson of Portland, Oregon, and Jeff and Ruthann DeFrang of Savage, Minnesota. For more information about our show or how you can listen to our podcast, head on over to LiveWireRadio.org. I'm Luke Burbank for Elena Passarello and the whole Livewire crew. Thank you so much for listening, and we will see you next week. <laughs>